All right, so hello everyone. I'm Norman Wahlberger, and today we're going to talk about those formulas that we derived, or perhaps I showed you last time, for the curvatures of surface. And let me start by reviewing those formulas very quickly. All right, there were really sort of three different versions of the same formulas. So the first was for a normal paraboloid. And that's a quadric in three-dimensional space, which has a vertex at the origin, which has a tangent plane given by Lx plus My plus Nz equals zero at the origin, and whose axis is perpendicular to, the, uh, to this tangent uh, plane there. All right, and we saw that this kind of uh, quadric has an equation of the form 0 equals 2LX plus MY plus NZ plus AMX minus LY squared plus BNX minus LZ squared plus CMZ minus NY squared so there are the three constants L, M, and N that are determined from the tangent plane, that's the gradient. And then there are three other variables, A, B, and C, that give us the three degrees of freedom that such a paraboloid can have. And uh, it's useful to introduce a few matrices. So for example, the Hessian, the three by three matrix, will have this form, A, M squared plus B, N squared. A L squared plus C N squared, B L squared plus C M squared. And it's symmetric with a minus A L M there, a minus B L N there, and a minus C M N there and there. Now, um, I didn't say it, I think, but I might mention here that the characteristic polynomial of this Hessian also has a pleasant form. It's x times x minus c1, c1, x squared minus c1x plus c2, where c1 and c2 are the same things that uh, were appearing in the last lecture when I was talking about the four by four matrix of which this is the, the top corner. Okay, and then the formulas for the curvatures were, the first curvature was this constant C1 all squared divided by L squared plus M squared plus N squared. And that was A plus B L squared plus A plus C M squared plus B plus C N squared. All of that squared over uh, the L squared plus M squared plus N squared. And that's the, we call this the first curvature. And the second curvature, capital K2, was defined to be C2, the second uh, coefficient here, divided by also L squared plus M squared plus N squared. And that's AB times L squared plus ACM squared plus BCN squared. That's generally the more important one. That's the Gaussian curvature. We're calling it also the second curvature. Or Gaussian curvature. Okay, so overall these are pretty uh, nice formulas. They depend on the six inputs, the three, the L, 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 M, and N that determine the tangent plane. And then these other three numbers that determine the shape of the paraboloid, A, B, and C. And the, uh, the denominators are sort of there to ensure that these things are well defined, that if you scale all the numbers by a factor, that these things remain unchanged. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one pair of e 
equations for the, these two fundamental curvatures of, of the surface. And then we had our second version. Do you all have that? Yeah. You probably have it already. So that was the definition, that was really the definition of the curvature, is just these, basically these characteristic coefficients of this characteristic polynomial, of the Hessian, suitably normalized, and maybe we have to square one of them so that we don't have any irrationalities. Now these other ones are just recasting of those ones. So the, here's the, uh, the story when we have a function. So if we have the function z equals alpha x plus beta y plus one half gamma x squared plus two delta x y plus epsilon y squared. Okay, we're still interested at the origin. Everything's at the origin here. Now we have a surface, thinking that is a function of uh, x and y. And we're at the point above uh, the origin. No, actually, we're assuming that uh, this surface actually goes through the origin, so I, I should make it go down like this. It actually goes through the origin because it has no constant term. Okay, and now the variables are alpha and beta, and gamma, delta, and epsilon. And in terms of those, the curvatures turn out to be beta squared plus one gamma minus two alpha beta delta plus alpha squared plus one epsilon. All of that squared over alpha squared plus beta squared plus one cubed. And the, the second curvature is just gamma epsilon minus delta squared over the same quantity, alpha squared plus beta squared plus one, this time squared. And the Hessian here is just the two by two matrix, uh, gamma, delta, delta, epsilon. And so this numerator is just the determinant of that little two by two Hessian. Okay, and then there was one more formula. Let's see if we can squeeze it here. And that was for the general conic. And our general conic has equation, I'll stay, stay here, zero equals two LX plus MY plus NZ, the same linear term as before. And I'll write the quadratic terms in terms of a general two by two matrix. Of course, symmetric P, Q, and R, and S, T, and U. All right, so there's now, as opposed to the normal paraboloid case, this is a general symmetric matrix. So this is not necessarily a paraboloid, and it's not necessarily having a vertex at the origin, but it does go through the origin, and we still want to know what's the curvatures uh, at the origin. So again, at the origin, the first curvature is, okay, it was a bit of a long expression, but I'll write it down. It has a pleasant symmetry to it. Q plus R times L squared plus P plus R times M squared plus P plus Q times N squared. In fact, I mean, it's got to depend on all nine quantities. So there's L, M, and N, those are three, and then there's the six quantities appearing in this Hessian. So all nine things have to be in there somewhere. So it's relatively simple c considering that. So then there's minus two S, L, M, minus two T, N, L, minus two U, N, M. All of that squared over 
L squared plus M squared plus N squared cubed again. While the Gaussian curvature, K2, is, well, there's 1 over L squared plus M squared plus N squared squared. And then there's an LMN times H star times LMN transpose. Where LM, where H star, also known as the adjugate of H, H is this matrix here, that is equal to QR minus U squared, PR minus T squared, PQ minus S squared, and then there's a TU minus RS, an SU minus QT, an ST minus PU, and similarly here a TU minus RS, an SU minus QT, and an ST minus PU. Okay, and the other thing I probably should mention is that in terms of the principal curvatures, little k1 and little k2, so these are the curvatures of the normal sections. Remember that um, if we have a tangent plane, we can take normal slices which contain the axis, that gives us curves. They have curvatures and as we vary the uh, normal section, the curvatures of those slices vary and there's sort of two extreme values and those are the principal curvatures. And they are related to the K1 and K2 by that little k1 plus little k2 squared is capital K1. While K1 times K2 is capital K2. I should also relate this to the mean curvature which is uh, often found, uh, the, this quantity H. Okay, so this is the same here, this is the same as H over, the same as 2H squared. Where H is the usual mean curvature. So my K1 is a little bit of a variant on the, on the mean curvature. It has the advantage that it's rational and we don't need any square roots to define it. That's why we have the square there. And because I think the sum of the um, eigenvalues is somehow more natural from a linear algebra point of view rather than the average. Okay, but that's not a big deal. Okay, so we have formulas for a wide variety of situations. We can pretty easily write down curvatures now of surfaces and I want to show you a few surfaces and, uh, and what kinds of curvatures do we get? All right, so our first example is a sphere. It's only reasonable. So we're going to take a sphere through the origin because we want to translate so that everything's at the origin anyway. That's the whole setup here. And so we'll suppose that it has a general center. Say center at x sub 0, y sub 0, and z sub 0. All right, so it's going through there. It's got some center over here somewhere. And there's our sphere. And we're interested in it at that origin right there. Okay, what's its equation? Well, its equation is x minus x zero squared plus y minus y zero squared plus z minus z zero squared equals x0 squared plus y0 squared plus z0 squared. And if I write that, bring everything to one side and sort of write it in the same 
way that I've been writing the other things, if I write it in the terms of the general conic form, then it'll be 2x0x x plus y0y y plus z0z z minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared equals 0. So in the language of the previous example, the LMN is just x0, y0, z0. And this Hessian matrix is just minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. OK, so what's the adjugate of this? Well. So what we have to do is we have to take, uh, for every point here, we have to sort of take a two by two determinant of the, the other minor. So those are all going to be ones. So it's really just the identity matrix. And so the, the form for the, um, well, I rubbed it off, but uh, the first one, the K1, will be a 4 over x0 squared plus y0 squared plus z0 squared. And the K2 will be just 1 over x0 squared plus y0 squared plus z0 squared. So if we call this quadrant, say, uh, R, so this is 1 over r, and this is 4 over r. Now in this case, the, um, the normal sections are all circles of radius, or quadrants, capital R, radius square root of capital R. So, the, um, so this thing really is the product of the uh, The curvatures, the curvatures are the one over the radii, the one over that radii times one over that radii, they're both equal to the square root of that, so when you square them you get one over r. And this really is k1 plus k2 all squared, because we get 2 over the square root of r, and when you uh, square that you get 4 over capital R. So at least the formulas work for a sphere, which is good. Sorry? K1 is almost the mean curvature. So K1 is equal to a 2 times the mean curvature squared. Yeah? Using our formula for K2, which we had just a few slides ago. Yep. Um, but if h star is the identity, shouldn't we get 1 on the L squared plus n squared plus n squared times L squared plus n squared plus n squared? Uh, da -da -da. Okay, what did I put? Did, was there an L squared plus m squared plus n squared squared on the bottom? There wasn't a square. Oh, there should be a square. Okay, okay good, good question. So uh, uh, the formula that I wrote down previously for the capital K2, the previous formula, involving the uh, adjoint of A star, the denominator should be L squared plus M squared plus N squared squared. Thank you. That was for K2. K1... Uh, K1 had a cubed. Yeah, a cubed. Good. Thanks for catching that. All right, so that's the sphere. All right, now let's do something somewhat more challenging. The ellipsoid. 
Okay, so we're going to choose an ellipsoid, uh, which is rather general. So we'll have it centered at x0, y0, z0, just like the previous sphere. But we'll have divided by a squared, divided by b squared, and divided by some c squared. And the only thing that we want to ensure is that this ellipsoid actually does go through the origin so that we don't have to translate it. Okay. So we're going to still have center at this point x0, y0, z0. It has some kind of elliptic cross section in all the three uh, planes. And it goes through the origin. And that's where we're interested in the curvature. And clearly, if we have any ellipsoid, we can translate it so that the point that we're interested in on it is at the origin. Okay, what do we have to put on the right-hand side to ensure that it goes to the origin? Well, we just have, if we stick in x, y equals z equals zero, we have to put over here x zero squared over a squared plus y zero squared over b squared plus z zero squared over c squared. All right, so that's the, the native equation. And now we have to rewrite it, bring it all on one side, get the linear terms together. So we'll take the linear terms and uh, clear denominators and so on. So there's going to be a b squared c squared x 0 times x plus an a squared c squared y 0 times y plus an a squared b squared z 0 times z. And then we have some quadratic terms, b squared, c squared, x squared, a squared, c squared, y squared, minus a squared, b squared, z squared, all of that equals zero. Okay, so now, Decades ago, it would be rather onerous, a little bit onerous to, to make this calculation, and it wouldn't be that bad, but these days you get your favorite computer algebra system. Might be Maple, might be Mathematica, maybe MATLAB or MUPAD. I use Scientific Workplace to, to write up my tech papers, and it has um, a work engine inside it, so I just work in Scientific Workplace. But whatever you do, you basically set up two functions, K1 and K2, that will input these, uh, these nine variables, and then you just press simplify, or factor, or whatever the command is. Okay, sometimes a bit of massaging is required, but basically it's, uh, for a computer, doing this kind of arithmetic is almost uh, trivial. It's all polynomial arithmetic. So what do we get? We get that K1 is A to the fourth, B to the fourth, C to the fourth, times B squared, C squared, B squared plus C squared, X zero squared, and then similar terms. A squared C squared times A squared plus C squared Y zero squared plus A squared B squared times A squared plus B squared Z zero squared. And all of that is squared. Over B to the fourth C to the fourth X zero squared plus A to the fourth c to the fourth y zero squared plus a to the fourth b to the fourth z zero squared. All of that cubed. That's k1. <laughs> and k2? It is a to the fourth, b to the fourth, c to the fourth, times b squared, c squared, x zero squared, plus a squared, c squared, uh, y zero squared, plus a squared, b squared, z zero squared. 
over b to the fourth, c to the fourth, x zero squared, plus a to the fourth, b to the fourth, y zero squared, plus a to the fourth, b to the fourth, z zero squared, all of that squared. Uh, the second term in the denominator from a zero should be a to the fourth, c to the fourth. <laughs> b to the fourth, c to the fourth, yes. a to the fourth, c to the fourth, thank you, yes, very excellent. Any other ones? Okay, now, as an exercise, um, I think it's interesting, this was sort of without any parameterization of the ellipsoid. Okay? The ellipsoid, of course, can also be parameterized, and uh, so one exercise, or maybe a problem to think about, is uh, what does it look like? What do these formulas reduced to with a parameterization. Okay, so if you put in a, rash, a, a rational parameterization or, a, or a, a circular function parameterization, then the formulas become quite different and they have their, their flavor looks a little bit different. It's an interesting exercise to, to, uh, to, to investigate that. Another interesting problem that's actually related to um, to some physics, evidently, is that uh, another exercise is to show that the, uh, this, the second curvature, k to this expression here, is also equal to q squared over a squared b squared c squared, where q is, so here's the, the point in question, here is the tangent plane at that point. If we look at the perpendicular quadrants from the center to the tangent plane, then that's Q. So you fix the, the ellipse, that means A, B, and C are, are determined because that's just part of the ellipse. And then as you move the point around, the tangent plane is further and closer away to the origin depending on where you are. The further you are away from the origin, from the center, from the center of the ellipsoid, well, the bigger the, uh, the curvature in this very direct fashion. So evidently this kind of thing is important in physics because sometimes we have uh, charge distributions that are spread over ellipsoids for example, and in this kind of computation, the curvatures, uh, the curvatures often have some physical significance. Okay, so the next example I want to consider is the ellipson, which was a surface I showed you, a model of, some time ago. It's um, a cubic surface, which comes from, from rational trigonometry. So we'll define this function, say at w, x, y, z equals x plus y plus z squared minus 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 4x, y, z equals 0. Okay, and it has a, well it has a different branches, but I showed you uh, some kind of tetrahedral uh, shape where it was a little, like a, a tetrahedron but kind of blown up, a little bit rounded. You may remember that. And uh, the, the significance of it is that if you take a triangle and instead of looking at the three angles, you have the three spreads, S1, S2, S3. Right? The three spreads, the spread S1, for example, or SI, is the same as sine squared of the corresponding angle. So the three squares of the signs, if you want, to use transcendental ideas, the three squares of the signs of a triangle uh, satisfy this relation. Okay, but the spreads themselves are actually completely rational quantities. And this, this is somehow the, um, the rational analog of this sum of the angles being 3.14159, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, uh, well, What does one do? So I'll just write down the, 
the uh, second curvature, which is the more interesting one. Basically, it's a quadratic with the cubic there, okay? So we can just expand it out, take the quadratic terms, then apply the formula, and, uh, and we get 4ABC times 1 minus A, 1 minus B, 1 minus C, all over AB, 1 minus A, 1 minus B, plus AC times 1 minus A, 1 minus C, uh, plus BC times 1 minus B, 1 minus C. Which if we want to, we, I suppose we could re rewrite a little bit more compactly like this. 1 over A times 1 minus A, plus 1 over B times 1 minus B, plus 1 over C times 1 minus C. Okay. And then I took a sort of a random cubic that I had never heard of. Um, so here's the ding dong cubic. And its surface is given by x squared plus y squared minus 1 minus z times z squared equals 0. And it's quite pleasant little curve or surface. It has a kind of cubic aspect. So it's like a cubic here. And then there's this uh, teardrop kind of uh, thing here. And then this part here kind of goes down and has a sort of a round. Yeah, maybe not very good, but it's sort of like a cone, a cubical cone with a top part. And if we, uh, it goes to the origin, if this is Z, then it's a, it's a, a, a a surface of revolution because it has the symmetry about the uh, the x y about the z axis because of the x squared plus y squared here, so it's a surface of revolution. And if you want to uh, compute its uh, curvature, it's a very simple task. You just take this thing out, expand it out. Take the quadratic terms, apply the formula, and two minutes later, you get the, the second curvature, which is the one I'm most interested in, is four times four minus three. Uh, I guess we should be at a point, so we should choose a point. So let's choose the point to A, B, C, say. A, B, C on, on that, that, uh, that thing. So you have to do a bit of translating and so on. But, uh, then you get four, four minus three uh, C all over C times nine C squared minus 16 C plus eight all squared. Which happily does agree with the, uh, the, the entry on uh, Wolfram's uh, what, world of mathematics, what's that called? Math world. Okay. So there's lots of potential, I think, for um, for investigating cubic surfaces, other surfaces. Just investigating what do the curvatures look like? What do the formulas look like? Uh, so there's one aspect or one sort of family of formulas that I haven't yet told you about. It's actually an important family of formulas. So we have three basic formulas for a surface. But there's a fourth formula which is actually probably classically the most well-known. Okay? So there's another set of uh, curvature formulas that result in, that result from thinking about a surface parametrically. That takes a little bit of uh, more work, but I just want to introduce the idea. So parametric surfaces. Uh, 
Okay, so what we have is our three-dimensional space, and we have some surface that we're interested in. And we're wanting to parameterize, well, maybe not all of it, but, but part of it. So we want to basically have some coordinates on part of it. Okay, and the way we do that is through a, uh, a mapping from our parameter space, well, let's say it might be UV, maybe a rectangle over here. So some rectangle in the UV plane, and we have a vector-valued function from this plane to the space. And so that the image of this rectangle is this little curved part of the surface. So that means we have coordinates then on the surface. So what does the general such map look like? So R, say from U to V, well it's going to be a point in three-dimensional space. And one way to write this down uh, somewhat efficiently is to write it as R1 times U plus R2 times V plus say one half of R11 U squared plus 2 R12 U V plus R22 V uh, squared. In general, there would be a constant term. Okay, there would also be a constant term in general, so maybe I should write R0, include that too. So there, the origin would go to some point R0. And these, these R's are in fact all vectors, okay? So R0 would actually be a vector. Uh, maybe X0, Y0, Z0. And then R1 is a vector. Some say X1, Y1, uh, Z1, and so on. They're all vectors. And of course, we can write down those vectors in terms of this, this function, if we like. So the, the vectors, Ri's and Rij's, are just various partial derivatives of this vector-valued function. Partial derivatives of the vector-valued function. Uh, R. Yeah, so for example, uh, you know, R1 would be the partial of R with respect to U. Evaluated at whatever uh, point, well, maybe zero, zero is where we're, we're interested in the image of this particular point, say, and looking at its neighborhood. R22 would be partial of R with respect to uh, V squared at zero, zero. Okay, so that's uh, all very good. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of, there's a lot of actual components in such a representation because strictly speaking, we have three uh, potentially completely free variables to choose for each one of these vectors. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Say if we normalize R0 to be the origin like we've been, we've been doing, then there's only five but there's five free vectors floating around, and five, so there's five times three variables. So if you want a curvature formula, well, you have to expect that it's gonna have 15 coefficients floating around in it somewhere. It's gonna be a, a function of the, all these various uh, entries. Okay, so there, is, uh, there are such formulas, and they're, they're quite important because classically, this is the standard way of thinking about a surface. Okay? And that's, that's following Gauss, really. So Gauss was the first one to really exploit this way of thinking about surfaces um, more than Euler. Euler had also thought very much about surfaces and made important progress. But uh, Gauss was... Uh, well, rather, rather practical at this stage of his life. He was working as a survey, sort of the survey uh, 
chief of his province in, in Germany. And uh, so he was actually going out in the field and making large-scale surveys. And so he was quite interested in practical things. And so this, this kind of idea probably came to him from the idea of you know, just going out and trying to understand, trying to think about how things were, were, were mapped out. So, but because of Gauss's strong influence on the subject, Gauss was the one who really understood the nature of the, of the curvature, especially K2. That's why it's called Gaussian curvature. He was the one who really understood that it's the fundamental fact uh, about it, which is usually called the theorema aggregium. And uh, because of his lead, it's still the, the, the case that most textbooks frame things in terms of par parametric surfaces. So it's quite a little bit opposite to what we're doing. We've adopted a more uh, algebraic geometry point of view. With, we're thinking of surfaces more as algebraic surfaces rather than as parametric surfaces. But, I mean, these are just two sides of a coin. But I think it's probably good to have a little bit of balance in the subject. And in particular, I mean, there's, there's an argument to be made that, that surfaces are maybe naturally a little bit more algebraic than they are parametric. Because there's lots of ways of parameterizing a surface. You know, if, you, if you're given, say, the ding-dong surface or whatever, there'd be you know, lots and lots of ways of, of parameterizing that. But the actual surface, its equation, is more or less completely determined. It's sort of canonical. So algebraically, uh, there's something to be said for, for taking this algebraic geometry point. So at some point, anyway, we are going to have to address the issue of what does curvature look like for a parametric surface. Okay. But in the next uh, few videos, we're going to become a little bit more qualitative because we've had a lot of formulas. So we're going to do a little bit more. We're going to go back to uh, the 18th and 19th century geometers. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the remarkable discoveries that they made that we now have the language to talk about connected with curvature and, and, uh, and consequences of the various curvatures. So lovely, beautiful things that they discovered. So we'll, I'll tell you about them uh, next little while.